Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am just another tinfoil hat. Welcome to my show. So today actually marks the hundredth video on my channel, which is kind of wild to think about. Um, 100 videos on just another tinfoil hat. That's a lot of talking about weird stuff. So thank you to everyone who invests their time in watching these videos. Um, but anyway, yeah, hundredth video on the channel, and I really wanted to do something special for that. So today I am very pleased to present one of my favorite cases from one of my favorite researchers. And that is going to be the St. Coletta Slasher, as detailed by the late, great Linda Godfrey. So briefly before we get started, I know I've mentioned um, Linda and her work many times on this channel and what an important sway she had on my life um, in many ways. I met her when I was 10 years old at a book signing. She was the first researcher of the paranormal and the weird and bizarre that I got to meet in person. And again, I've said it before and I'll say it again, that changed my life. It really just to see someone pursuing these things, regardless of whether it's considered weird or out there or, you know, hey, some people think it's a total waste of time. That just really meant something to me. So I have the two books that I got way back in 2006 at that book signing. Um, these truly are some of my treasures. And yeah, this case is detailed to various extents in both of these and I am very pleased to be covering it here on my channel. So, without further ado. So, sometime in 1936, a man by the name of Mark Shackleman worked as a night watchman for St. Coletta's, an institution for those with developmental disabilities run by the Sisters of St. Francis of Assisi. It's located near Jefferson, Wisconsin. At the time of this encounter, it was actually known as St. Coletta's School for Exceptional Children. Mark Shackleman claimed that one night as he was patrolling the grounds around midnight, he came upon a strange creature kneeling on top of a Native American burial mound. Mark, who in 1958 confided this tale to his son Joe Shackleman, described the creature for Joe to sketch, and this sketch is included in Linda's book The Beast of Bray Road, and it shows this very muscular humanoid being covered in dark hair with a long, vaguely canine face and pointed ears. Now this case is really cool because most dogman encounters describe much more canid bodies, you know, such as a lot of these beasts have a tail and quote-unquote backward-facing knees. Um, Linda Godfrey came to the conclusion that a lot of the times these backward-facing knees kind of tend to look more like the elongated foot of most canines, um, and that the knee is actually the ankle. Um, whereas this beast was decidedly humanoid. Mark said that the being was clawing at the ground and that its hands appeared odd, like the thumb and pinky finger were smaller and shorter, almost withered, um, much shorter than the three middle fingers, and that they were tucked in towards the palm as it scraped at the ground. So Mark claimed that as he approached the beast, it turned around and fled the scene. The next day he went to the mound to check for marks and he did see strange rake marks, which appeared to be of, have been made by three long claws. However, this was far from the end of the encounter. The next night, again around midnight, Mark went to the same place, only this time he had brought his handy dandy flashlight. Yes, he reasoned that he could use the large flashlight as a weapon if he had to. Um, so yet again, he came to the same spot, and yet again, there was still the strange creature kneeling on top of the mound and clawing at it. However, as Mark approached this beast, this time it didn't run away. Rather, it stood fully upright. He claimed that the beast stood about six feet tall, with eyes that he said felt like they looked right into him. At the, as if the sight of this strange, humanoid, wolf-eared, clawed creature isn't bad enough, he also claimed that it gave off a terrible odor like rotting meat. So, once it had raised itself up and was staring in Mark's face, he said that it growled a strange, low growl, which sounded to Mark almost vaguely like speech. He said it sounded like the beast said, Gadara, in a voice he referred to as neo-human. Now, as the creature seemed like it was not going to back down, Mark fell back on one of those innate defense mechanisms and prayed for God to save him from the beast. Finally, it turned and walked away. However, Mark stood there for some, some time longer, just offering thanks, and he said that the terrible smell continued to linger in the area. Now, many, many years later, when he was discussing this with his son, his son Joe asked whether he thought this creature was just some animal or if it was something, you know, of some other plane of existence, and Mark responded that he believed that the thing came, quote-unquote, straight out of hell. 
In The Beast of Bray Road, Linda really goes into this line of reasoning regarding the biblical connections to the world of Gadara, as well as a discussion on one of my favorite topics, which is hellhounds. So, I mean, for this case alone, the book is well worth the read, um, and that's not even taking into account just how absolutely fantastic the rest of it is. Now, for my part, this case contains one of my current fascinations, which is this concept of anomalous beings digging, scratching, poking, or otherwise disturbing the earth. Um, I just covered the case of the slouchy Stockton spooks, these strange little beings which were observed poking in, at the middle of a road. And it was really during that video that I started thinking like, yeah, there's a lot of entities, whether ufological or cryptozoological, which for some reason seem to really enjoy digging up earth. And right as I was kind of thinking about that after I published the video, I also happened to notice that there was another new video from one of my other favorite researchers, Chad Lewis, over on his Supernatural Dares channel. Um, here on YouTube, so go check that out, regarding a grave digging phantom. So all told, you know, it seems as though anomalies of every different other world, whether we're talking cryptozoological, ghostly, or ufological, are very interested in dirt. Another concept I've been very intrigued by lately is this bizarre kind of, you know, case of the observer and the observed with these strange entities just locking eyes with people. You know, it seems as though there is just a really strong case of eye contact with a lot of paranormal encounters. Um, in this case, again, it has the strange being pretty much entering a staring contest with the poor night watchman who had stumbled upon it. Now, one thing that Linda Godfrey really did a lot of research on too was the connection of sightings of cryptids, especially the man-wolf, to different Native American effigy mounds or burial mounds. I mean, this case is an absolute kind of poster child for that. You have an anomalous being right on top of and scratching into a burial mound. And of course, this is something that John Keel was very interested in as well. It seems as though any sort of um, ancient earthworks just seems to be some sort of beacon for anomalous phenomenon. Now, launching into this next part, I will put up the disclaimer that, again, I don't really subscribe to any particular belief system about any form of anomalous phenomenon. Um, and so mentioning the word demon um, definitely, I'm sure, has a very strong knee-jerk reaction for some people. However, if we look at this case, um, and especially Mark Shackleman's kind of response to it, he believed that there was some sort of religious or spiritual implication from him seeing this beast. Also, it occurred literally right on a sacred burial ground and right next to an institution run by a convent of nuns. It's intriguing to see that there are several aspects of this case that fit into kind of more classic demonology, um, such as his prayer disrupting the beast and causing it to leave the scene. Now, I will say that it seems as though either prayer or swear seems to get these things to leave, because of course I think of um, the bizarre encounter from the Sandusky Sasquatch, where the gentleman who had seen the Sasquatch and then had his bedroom invaded by these glowing pink beings said that they finally left when he started swearing at it. But anyway, in this case, Mark Shackleman's prayer appeared to have caused the creature to turn and leave. Um, a few other aspects which really correlate to that are, of course, the scratches of three. It's pretty much a trope now, very much overused by Hollywood, that marks of three seem to, for some reason, correlate to negative phenomena. Um, add into that the fact that it smelled like rotten meat, and I will say it doesn't seem like a very pleasant creature. Again, you know, pinning anything down to a particular belief system or belief structure, to me, just, you know, we'll never really be able to pin these anomalies down into any one thing. But it is cool to see these different belief systems and how they kind of play with the phenomenon. Speaking of the nuns which ran this institution, and this might be a huge stretch, I don't know, um, but it's so interesting to me because they were the Franciscan Order of Nuns, so of course based in St. Francis of Assisi's teachings. And he was known to have effectively calmed or domesticated this massive wolf which had terrorized um, a small village. Uh, and it's just, it's interesting to me because, you know, again, maybe it's a total stretch, but you have the Franciscan nuns running this thing and all of a sudden you have this bizarre wolf-like creature, you know, terrorizing this night watchman. So again, maybe a coincidence, maybe not, maybe a stretch, but it just, it seemed too weird for me to not mention. Now, finally too, we have the fact that it seems like these encounters truly are intent upon the viewer. I mean, this being was in the same location doing the same thing two nights in a row. Um, so again, lightning doesn't seem to strike the same place twice, however cryptids do. 
um, I would really love to compile a list of all of these cases where it's almost like perfect timing. You know, the witness, you know, comes upon this beast, you know, and if they had been just two seconds sooner or later, they would have missed it. Or of course, as in this case, or of course, um, Doc Priestley's case of the Marlington encounter, where he saw the same creature two times in a row. It's like, if you don't really, you have the first sighting, and maybe it's like priming them for something more, because then the second sighting leaves a more lasting effect. Um, which, I mean, I guess we could say happened in this case as well. The first sighting, the beast ran off. The second sighting, it stayed in this very intimidating stare down with Mark Shackleman um, until it finally wandered away. And all this too is without even mentioning the fact that he claimed this beast actually spoke to him, which, I mean, isn't unheard of when it comes to cryptid encounters, but it definitely is one of the most anomalous anomalies that you can find. So again, if you enjoyed this episode, I highly recommend checking out Linda Godfrey's books. Um, her line of research is all-encompassing and phenomenal, and she has such a great sense of humor um, permeating her work. So um, I will say too, she is sorely missed. Well, if you enjoyed this, my 100th episode on the St. Coletta Slasher, please like, and if you're new to the field of crop circles, go ahead and subscribe to see what weirdness the future may have in store. Till then, you can keep up with me on my free blog at patreon.com. And for today, I am Zelia Edgar, signing off. Do we? <laughs>